song is found There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no
clap? All right, now we're gonna clap in time. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins and all your guilty stains. Let that river of life wash it all away. You've been searching, carrying burdens. You've been lost, looking for a home. You've been Something is missing You should know You are not alone In my church Brothers, sisters Come on down to that river Guaranteed you'll never be the same There's a fountain flowing From the heart of the Savior Bring your sins and all your guilty stains Let that river of life wash it all away seated. <laughs> and all God's people said, Amen. Here we go. I just, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> I just love kids and seeing them here and, and the growing number of them. Um, what a blessing to add to our worship, just seeing them. Can we just pray for the, for the kids just right now? Lord, I just pray over the children here in our church. And I pray that as they uh, move to the different classes tailored just for them, that you would speak to them deeply, that their faith would, in fact, inspire our faith. And I pray your blessing over them and all of the teachers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, there's cards, if you haven't noticed. There are Thanksgiving Day cards in the parlor um, on tables. Please take some time and sign them. You don't, there's 24 or 25 cards. These are cards for the people who are connected to our church but are shut-ins. And this, the prayer group would like to have the church sign the cards uh, today. So grab five cards, 10 cards, 25 cards, but please, just on your way out, sign uh, cards. Speaking of cards, we have uh, cards here for prayer requests. We have cards here for your information. If you're visiting with us, then just 
uh, give us some information so that we can greet you and, and kind of get to know you a little bit more. So there are those cards. Um, join us after church if you're new uh, here. We have a dinner after church. Uh, right down the aisle here, follow your nose. Uh, and everyone is welcome. We have a prayer email. We're about to take prayer requests right now, um, but the prayer email for the requests that are not urgent in nature or don't need to be shared within the whole church body at this time. So even, even right now, some of you are tech savvy enough to, to just text a prayer request to that email address. Feel free to do that right now. Those emails that you send are sent out to our prayer warriors, uh, to the prayer group, to, to people. If it's something that's really confidential, just put in the subject line, confidential, and it will only go to the church leaders, and, and that's all. Uh, so be aware of our prayer email address. Our announcements are found in our newsletter, which can be found on our website. We can just send a prayer email and say, hey, I'd like to receive the newsletter in my email, and, and we'll make sure that that happens. Um, but uh, prayer requests this morning that I'm already aware of, to continue to be praying for Bob and for Heather, uh, to continue to be praying for Holly Smith, uh, to continue to be praying for Brian Hamill and for his family, and as they are grieving the loss of Brian's mom. And, uh, we have a, another prayer request, uh, Barb, who brings us these flowers that we have every Sunday. If you're not aware, Barb not only presents these flowers to us when we purchase them. Kids don't distract me, but my granddaughter takes my eyes. <laughs> it's not a distraction. It's just... T uh, uh, so Barb brings these flowers and presents them here for us when we purchase them. But you may not be aware that Barb prays over the flowers that she brings here to you. And uh, Barb is having surgery, reconstructive surgery uh, on her ankle, and she's asked us to be praying for that. Um, also, uh, Todd's uh, good friend Troy has passed away, and we want to be praying for, for, for Todd, for Troy's family. Um, and Bob Bantham has asked for prayer for his cousin, Deb, who's having surgery on Thursday. Uh, other prayer requests that are urgent and need to be shared, we can take those now. Okay, so why don't we pray and uh, we'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Father, once again, we come before you. And, and we come with a confidence that you hear our prayers. And, and we pray, Lord, continuously for, for Bob and for Heather and for Holly. And we, we ask you, Lord, to just be with them, to, to work in their lives, healing, restoring, comforting. Lord, we pray for, for Brian and for his family. We pray that you would comfort them in this time, and Lord, that your grace would abound. We pray, Lord, for Barb and for her ankle and the reconstructive surgery that she needs, and we thank you for her ministry of, of flowers uh, that she blesses us with. Lord, we pray for Todd. We pray for, for Troy's family. We just... And we pray for Deb and for Bob's cousin Deb and for the surgery that she's having on Thursday. And we, we pray that you would uh, heal her, that the surgery would be successful. And Lord, we just pray over all of what's going on in our lives, in our, in our communities, in our country and in the world. And we ask that your grace, your grace, would be abounding through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to start out this morning with a story that takes place in the second book of the Bible, the book called Exodus. And, and here's the setup for the story. Moses, who you've probably heard uh, you know, of, Moses is in a distant land with relatives. He's in a place of hiding because he's wanted for murder in Egypt. He, he was raised in the Pharaoh's household, even though he was a Hebrew. He saw, uh, he saw overseers of the Hebrew slaves um, hurting another Hebrew, and he stepped in, and in the process, he kills this person, and then he has to flee. So just understand that the last place, the last place that Moses ever wants to be is Egypt. And so here we find this story in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Let's just look at that this morning. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire and it didn't burn up. And so Moses is, is with his flocks, He's, he's at the mountain of God, and he sees a bush on fire, but not consumed by it, not burnt up by it. And, and so Moses does what any one of us would do if we saw some kind of supernatural thing like that. He says, what's that? What's that? Oh, yes, he didn't touch it. Oh, I see what you're saying. You'd want to touch it. Gotcha. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. I, I think of the commercials, you know, when they've got the, let's, let's not go to the car that's running. Let's go downstairs or let's hide behind those chainsaws. Uh, he sees this bush that won't burn up and he says, Huh. Let's go check that out. It must have been beautifully amazing and fearful to draw him into that, but he's, he's drawn in, and I believe that we would have been drawn to it. I believe our spirit knows when something is evil and knows when something is godly. And so Moses is drawn to it. When the Lord saw that, Mo that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Well, if you weren't kind of freaking out at the bush not being consumed, and now you're hearing your name, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. God is extremely concerned about our suffering. 
So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out that the land out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Prezites, the Termites, the Hevazites, and the Jebusites. So he's got a plan. He's got a plan to rescue those who are enslaved. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Just what he wanted to hear. So now, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Wait, what? The last place, God, the last place I want to go is Egypt. You want to send me to tell Pharaoh let the slaves go? I can't even imagine Moses' thought pattern right now. Uh, I'm thinking, he's thinking, I should have just turned around. <laughs> I should have just ignored that bush. But, the, but Moses said to God, I could just, this is how he must have said it. it. It's just not the way you read it. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you'll worship God here on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And, and they ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? You see, all of the gods had names. If I'm going back there, who are you? What, what is your name? And so God said, oh, this story is to be continued. We have to. So just, you got questions. Got questions. G-U-T, got questions. You know, we got milk, we got questions. Got questions. We're starting a, a new series today on gut questions. Those kind of questions that just kind of come from the gut, that sit in your gut, that, that just demand answers, but they are not easy in coming. And, and so we're going to look at questions like, can we be certain about anything? What is knowledge? Can we trust our senses? Does God exist? Why does God allow suffering? No one has ever asked that question around in your circles, have they? Do we have free will? Just this week, one of you texted me and said, Joe, do we have free will? I said, you know, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> Will the sun rise tomorrow? Do we have a soul? Will you survive death? What's truth? What really, really matters? Gut questions, those questions that are in your gut. And, and as we answer each of these 11 questions, they stand alone. You don't feel as though if you miss one, you can't get caught up. They stand alone, and yet at the same time, I'm going to try to carefully build each one on top of the other as well. And, and, and I understand, you know, that you may be in, in here today thinking, well, I already got all those answers. I'm good. See me after. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to know. 
But, but you may have some of those answers. You may have some of these answers. You, you may, in fact, be wrestling with some of those questions right now. You may, you may not be wrestling with all of them, but maybe, maybe one of those in particular that you're thinking, do I really have to wait weeks to get to this one? Maybe you're, maybe you're wrestling. Maybe, maybe you know someone who's wrestling with one of these gut questions. And, and you just don't know really how to approach that. Maybe you're the skeptic. Maybe you're just saying, it's just a bunch of baloney anyway. Maybe you're the skeptic. Maybe you're the one saying, I'm not so sure God exists. I'm not so, so sure of anything. Maybe, maybe that's you. And, <laughs> and maybe you're just thinking, great, I'm just not interested. I'm just not interested in this whole thing. How fast can you get through this? I hope if you're not interested that you'll see the point of it and that you'll be drawn in and that there'll be a level of engagement and connection to your life as we look to these questions. I, I, I'm really hoping that as we, as we look at these questions, that our faith will grow deeper as a result of it. Why is it important, these kind of questions? Paul, when he was in Athens, it tells us in the, in, his, in the book of Acts, Paul in Athens has this to say in chapter 17. <clears throat> Paul then stood up in the meeting at the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. I, I see as I look around that, that you are very religious. For... For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God, to a God without a name, hmm. to a God without a name. Moving on in verse 26, uh, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the times set forth for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So, so God... God did this and he's done all of what's going on in your life that you might seek him, reach out for him and, and find him. And, and what's really interesting is what is said next. For in him we live and move and have our being. And, and you notice it's in quotes. He's quoting something. And, and then he, for in him we live and move and have our being as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring in, in quotes again. And, and what we can take from this, it says, as some of your poets have said, the poets were the philosophers of the time. And, and so Paul is taking the philosophy the things, those gut questions that were being asked in Athens, the, 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 the birthplace, if you will, of, of much of the philosophy that we study today. And, and, and so Paul is recognizing and quoting philosophers and he's bringing that into his gospel presentation of what really matters. <laughs> gut questions. So, so if you're wrestling, if, you're, if you have someone else who's wrestling, if you have all the answers, if you're the skeptic, even if you're not interested, Paul shows us it's important to connect with the philosophers of his time, and I think it's important for us today as well. And here's something else. I know this to be certain. We, Christians, us, I'm addressing the Christians, us Christians, 
We need to live in such a way that people come to us with their gut questions seeking answers. Because, we're, because the world isn't coming to the church with their gut questions seeking answers. The, the world is going everywhere but. And, and we need to live in such a way that these gut questions, as we live through these gut questions, that, that people come to us and ask the gut questions seeking answers. Gut questions, seeking answers. We need to be able to have a reason, and we need to be prepared. My, well, I wouldn't say my favorite verse. I almost said my favorite verse. It's not my favorite verse. It's my next to this, my favorite verse. Comes from First Peter. But this, I live by this. And 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 Peter says, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone, to, has a, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. What questions more than gut questions connect us to the hope that we have? But do this with gentleness and respect. Peter is telling us that we Christians need to be prepared and live in such a way that people are seeking out answers from us. Be prepared to give an answer means that people are coming with a question. And so today we're going to look, I hope, we're going to look at this idea. Can we be certain about anything? Can we be certain about anything. I think it's interesting when we look at the word believe and we look at the word know. Believe and know. Look, look, look at this. Uh, I could say, I believe two plus three equals five. And I can, I can say I really believe that. I, I can say I believe it will snow tomorrow. Annie and I were on the beach last Saturday, 72 degrees. That's how God intended it. <laughs> I, I believe that. I believe Washington was the first president. I believe the Patriots will win the Super Bowl. Wow. Skeptics. There's skeptics out there. I believe that there are other life forms. I'm not saying I believe these. I'm, I'm listing these, okay? But I'm not ruling that out. I believe that there's no God, or I believe there is a God. You, we can say, I believe, when we connect words. We can say, I believe, and that's somewhat acceptable to the world today, isn't it? But what if we change that? What if we, what if we talk more about the word no? Well, let's look at those same questions, only now instead of I believe. I know two plus three equals five. Nobody is saying, I don't think so, because we all kind of collectively say we know that. Uh, I know it will snow tomorrow. Suddenly, suddenly not everybody is saying, Joe said it. It, it will happen. True, Buffalo is, uh, I know Washington was the first president, but do we? Were you there? What are we basing that on? Do we really know? I, I know the Patriots will win the Super Bowl. You haven't been <laughs> Painfully, I have. I know there are other life forms. I know there's no God. I know there is a God. When we, when we start to say, I know, we add this element of certainty, and certainty rubs us. When, when, when we say, <laughs> I don't know, I just believe, people are okay with that. But then when we're in the conversation and we say, listen, I know, that's a rub. It doesn't, 
fit well with us? And, and, and can we really be certain about things? Can we be certain? I mean, can we be completely certain? Can we be 100% certain? Uh, many of you, I even bought a Powerball ticket a while back just when that jackpot was super. Uh, <laughs> I think we could pretty much say that, that with the one ticket, or what, how many did we buy? I think we, we, bought a ten, we put $10 down. I was pretty certain that our 10 tickets were not going to win. But maybe. <laughs> just, just maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe. <laughs> That's right. But when we look at math, when we look at some things in math, we can be certain. When we, when we look at some things in science, we can be certain. But when we look at philosophical things, can we be certain? When we look at religious things, can we be certain? Uh, can, we, can we bet our life on it? Uh, we're, we're all here in faith, but... But if we had to actually bet our life on it, would it stay as real? Would we cave? Can we be certain about anything? My father would say, yes, you can be certain about two things. Death and taxes. That you can be certain about. But, but there was certainty that the earth was the center of the universe. And that turned out wrong. Uh, or did it? Can we be certain? Uh, that the world is flat. Can we be certain? These, these are philosophical questions. Can we be certain? Uh, you know, swimming after eating causes cramps. I hated that rule. <laughs> and now I find out it meant nothing. I calculate out I could have been swimming an additional 48 hours. That's it, yeah. Can we be certain? There's a philosopher, his name is Descartes. The S's, both S's are silent. Descartes. And, and Descartes lived 1596 to 1650, 400 years ago. And I'm not going to, don't check out on me. I'm not going to go deep into philosophy. But like Paul, I'm going to connect philosophy and draw out, draw out what we need to, to connect it to the message of the gospel. Descartes wasn't... Uh, wasn't a slouch, he, he actually came up with analytical geometry. You have him to thank, some of you. I'm looking at one person in particular. Uh, it's a long story. Um, analytical geometry. He, he systematized the use of exponents. He brought into question the whole thing about negative numbers. And, and uh, he's, he's a pretty brilliant guy. And, 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 and then he talked about, on the philosophical side of things, he, he started asking the question about dreams. He, he said, are we, are we right now actually awake? I, I'm looking around, actually. <laughs> See if anybody needs a nudge. No, we're good so far. But he, but, but he questioned this idea of dreams, and he said, are we really awake, or are we dreaming? Uh, he, he thought about this idea of hallucinations. Maybe, maybe the, this is just a hallucination. And he, and he questioned our senses. I have an audio clip that's coming up. With, with, it's very short, but I'll need the audio on it. He questioned whether our senses could be trusted or not. Can we, can we trust our senses? And, and today, I wonder what Descartes would think when we 
when we look at a world of uh, virtual reality gaming. We all live in the Matrix. I'm getting there. <laughs> oh, we don't have the audio. Let me go back. Sorry. Ready? I'll wait and see. If, it, if it's time consuming, we can skip it. Uh, that, that's all right, we're, we're really all set. It's, it's such a short clip. Okay, so he has the virtual reality things on, right? Everybody know what these things are? Okay, he screams. You can hear him. Oh, it's, it's okay. It's okay, it's, uh, it wasn't real. And, and, and Descartes, today, he might be thinking, whoa, whoa, this is messing with my mind. <laughs> we, is this all just a big VR thing? Is this really real? And, and how can I be sure? And, and, and he began, because of the, the trial of Galileo and, and science and the position that they were taking against the church and the position the church was taking, he, he began to think, we need a system of thinking, and, and I need to start from scratch. I need to just take away and remove absolutely everything that I think I know because it might be actually an illusion. And, 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 and he said we need to start from scratch, and he, and he needed to find truths that, that he saw were certain and true, truths that were certain and true. And, and, and so he found truth in math. He found comfort that two plus three is five. He found comfort in math. But outside of math, he thought, perhaps we aren't living in the matrix. If you don't know, the, this is a, a computer screen from a, a series of movies called The Matrix, where this kind of philosophical thought is, is really brought out. And, and, and in The Matrix, people are living a complicated artificial intelligence computer program. Meanwhile, they themselves are batteries for mechanical machines that have taken over the world. And that everything that they were experiencing as though while it was real to them, it was just an illusion. And Descartes is saying, maybe it's just an illusion, and, and, and he was just, I mean, he, he lived himself in solitude thinking about this, and, and then he came up with this philosophical statement that changed everything, and, and actually made a shift in, from the scholastic, uh, you know, movement of philosophy into the, what's called modern philosophy, and he, and he made this statement, I think, therefore I am. If you're a Moody Blues fan, there's a, a in the beginning, this before, you know, as a lead in, you know, this is in, in one of the songs, I think, therefore I am. But, but here's what Descartes was saying I exist. I have to exist. And even if right now this is all an illusion, the illusion had to be planted in something. So regardless of whether I'm in an illusion or in reality, I must exist. And this was freeing to him. He found a truth that couldn't be argued. He existed and he knew that he existed. I think, therefore, I am. I am. This idea of I am is a verb to be. It's this idea of I exist. I exist and I'm able to think because I can think I exist. And, and, and so Descartes would say that I know I exist, but you might just be part of my dream. I, I still might be dreaming, but I know I exist. This is where he landed. You may be... You may exist, 
And all of us are part of your dream. Uh, so the idea is just, can we be certain of more than our own existence? That's, that's what Descartes spent a lot more time thinking about. Can we be certain beyond our own existence of anything? Okay, so back to the burning bush. Moses, frantic, you're sending me where? I don't want to go there. You, what? Well, well wait, wait. If, if I am being sent there, you got you to gotta give me something. What is your name? And, and this is the reply going back to where we started. God said to Moses, in answer to the question, what is your name? God said to Moses, I am who I am am this is what you're to say to the israelites i am has sent me to you i am god also said to moses say to the israelites the the lord god of your fathers the god of abraham the god of isaac the god of jacob has sent me to you this is my name forever the name by which i am to be remembered from generation to generation to generation to generation this whole idea of i am who I am. The, the Hebrew has this continuous format to it. The, the Hebrew has this ongoing, never stopping. The, the Hebrew has this idea of first and last and everything in between. The, it has the context of the present always being. From generation to generation, ongoing, ongoing, existing i i think that that there's much to be said about this passage and and what i'm looking at today is connecting this to descartes dilemma of can we be certain of anything past our own existence i believe that if i were to have a conversation with descartes today i'd say have you checked out exodus chapter 3 verses 1 to 15 what do you make of this? What do you make? Is God declaring here that he is existent and he knows it and he's proclaiming it? I exist and I am aware of my existence and I am now making you aware of that existence. I believe that this is a claim in the same way that we can claim to exist, not that we are claiming to be God, I'm not saying that, but in the same way that we can claim to exist, wouldn't it make sense that our Creator could make the same claim to be existent? And what's really interesting is that Jesus is questioned about His existence. Jesus is questioned about his existence in John chapter 8. Look what he says. At this, the Jews explained, now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died and, and so did the prophets, yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, they'll never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you don't know him, I know him. If I said I didn't, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it and was glad. What? What? You're not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and, and, and you've seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, ego ame, the Greek, I am. A direct connection to the name.
a direct connection to the unknown God's name. A direct connection. Before Abraham was, I am. They knew what he was saying because the next verse says they picked up stones to stone him for what he had just said. And so just in asking the question, is that if only there was a way to connect our existence with God's existence. So my logic here is that we can know that we exist. And, and God has made this claim that he exists. Is it possible that the two can be brought together so that, so that we would know that God exists? It, Descartes said that he knew of his existence and that it was, it was um, clear and vibrant. That it was a truth that was clear and vibrant. I mean, what if we could actually know in a clear and vibrant way that not only does God exist, but that we exist with him, in him, and and are brought into a place of vivid and clear unity with a truth that is beyond all truths. We can. In, in, in Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul says this, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if we live according to the sinful nature, we'll die. But if by the Spirit we're able to put to death the misdeeds of the body, we will live. Paul's talking in a philosophical construct that... That, that our flesh needs more. And, and because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. Paul is saying that we can receive it. A spirit. We, we've seen that, that God the Father has proclaimed himself to be existent, that Christ has claimed himself to be that same existent, and now we're hearing about the spirit that we can receive. That we can receive. Wouldn't it be something if the spirit that we could receive could somehow connect with our spirit and testify to us that it's true? Guess what? It is. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I, I hope I can make this clear. God exists. And we exist. And, and the Spirit, his Spirit can be given to us. We can receive that Spirit and then that spirit will testify with our spirit of the truth that we're God's children. That we can know that, that our belief and knowing can come together. I shared this before, but I share it again because I think it's so fitting to end this, this first segment. On January 1st in 1994, I was wrestling with gut questions. And, and I wrote this in my journal. Um, in 1994. I began this particular book two years ago at this time. This is the, the journal book that I was writing in. I, I began this particular book two years ago at this time. I, I stated 
that I was planning to use these pages to record different thoughts and directions to spend the time in the desert praying and seeking. I, I was wrestling. I was in the desert. I would, and I was going to use this time to just pray and seek. Between these covers is certainly a lot of thought and growth as well. I've been in the desert for so long. I've experienced the pain and tragedy of losing my father, something I still mourn for now. The wound is as fresh today as two years ago. I have another son, Joey, and soon I'll father a third child. I've struggled with God and myself. And over the last two years, I found a deeper faith and a greater sensitivity than I had before. I know that God's direction for my life is mainly evangelism, and I know that any ministry that moves me away from this gift is not what I should be considering. I've also learned about servanthood and that this is my greatest weakness. I've not found a great deal of answers as I had expected and even at times demanded of God. I felt alone and out of touch with the God I worship. Maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe my words are connecting with your spirit right now. Maybe you've had a great deal of questions, but you haven't found a great deal of answers. The things that you've expected from God, the things that you've demanded from God, maybe, maybe they just haven't been satisfying to you. But through it all, I've come to realize that faith is not always easy to maintain. Can you resonate with that? Faith, as important as it is, is not always easy to maintain. And, and, and we, even of faith, can be lost in a sea of doubt in a, in, in, in a place where these gut questions just are not being satisfied. But through it all, I've come to realize that faith is not always easy to maintain, but there is something within me at the depths of my very being. This is, what, this is what Descartes was talking about, that there was something within the depths of his being that he was real and that he existed and that there was something more than that. And I'm telling you, there is something more than that if that's where you are. Through it all, I've come to realize that faith is not always easy to maintain, but there is something within me at the depths of my very being that assures me that God is there, that Jesus has in fact died for me, paid the debt in full, and has never left. As much as I felt as though he wasn't there, he never left. In the prayers to God that seem to go unanswered and fall on deaf ears, I have never swayed from the comfort I feel throughout every day of my existence. I can tell you from 1994 to 2022, that hasn't changed. No matter how much I wrestle, there is something within me that is unswayable. Something in me that says God is real, that his spirit is in me, that his spirit testifies with my spirit that I am his child. And if you're not sure, if you're thinking, I don't know what he's talking about, I would like to know, then please, you need to talk to me. My greatest joy would be revealing that truth to your spirit. 
Lastly, I go on to say, as I look back over 12 years, as I look back over 40 years of faith and living and following as best I can, as I look back over 12 years that I've been a Christian, I also realize that I'm in no way the same person, that many things in my life are different, and this has happened not by decisions I consciously made, having determined that, yes, this is God's will for me, Rather, my life is different and has been molded in a direction I clearly see as growth by one decision alone. One decision alone. That decision was to accept Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior in my life. That Holy Spirit testified to my spirit of that truth, the Holy Spirit living in me has done the rest. Where are you? You're, you're not part of my dream. You're real. And, I, and, and as we go through these questions, I am not making light of the difficulties, the sufferings, and the pain that we endure. I'm just trying to make sense of it along with you. We are real. God is real. And He can make Himself real to us. Does. Let's pray. Father, may your spirit testify to our spirit that we are your children. And in that knowledge, may we cry out, Dad, help us as we wrestle with life. And may we wrestle with life well with you that others may come and ask us to give an answer for the hope that we have within. May the unknown God be made known. May your name be high and lifted up. In Jesus' name,
Worship. We, we start like this, we, we walk through the scriptures, we pray for each other, and, and we bring it all down like that, and we close with a hymn, and then we go out and we eat and fellowship. That's worship. And that's what we need to take to the world, to our families, to our employees, employers, to our community. That's worship. Let's stand and, and conclude our worship with him 797.
a benediction today, the verse for us to, to take with us after all of this comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And Paul writes, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Let's pray. Father, as we go forward, may we think more deeply of the uniqueness that, can, that, that takes place when your spirit testifies with our spirit. May, may we go forward truly transformed and changed by the power of your spirit. And may we again come together to worship you in your glory, for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen.